the 11 million people that are here illegally in a way that's fair and compassionate, but also fair to the people that did it right, and also a way that ensures that this never, ever happens again. And I hope when we come back here in a few days, we will begin to work on that together for the good of our country and the future of our great nation. With that, uh, I suggest the absence of a court. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander. The Senate this evening held a procedural vote to end debate on the Internet sales tax bill. And with a vote of 63 to 30, cloture was invoked. So a vote on final passage of that bill will happen on Monday, May 6th at 5 p.m. Eastern after a week-long break. The chamber held that vote after Democrats, including Majority Whip Dick Durbin, said that they were in the midst of a filibuster in the Senate on the measure. A congressional Quarterly writes that Montana Democrat Max Baucus continued blocking efforts to move amendments to the bill, objecting to an attempt by Susan Collins of Maine, also a Republican, to offer a proposal to the legislation. So once again, a vote on final passage of the Internet sales tax bill will happen on Monday, May 6 at 5 p.m. Eastern. Here in the Senate, we also heard a couple speeches on the Senate floor today about immigration. Uh, the Hill writes that leaders of the House Judiciary Committee announced today that they would begin introducing a series of narrow immigration reform proposals, choosing not to wait for a bipartisan coalition to reach agreement on legislation. 
saying the committee would examine immigration reform in a step-by-step approach. Uh, Chairman Bob Goodlatte said Republicans would introduce the first two pieces of legislation this week. Uh, One bill would establish an agricultural guest worker program, and another would create an employment verification system for businesses. Here's that announcement by Chairman Goodlatte. Well, good morning and thank you for being here. I'm Bob Goodlatte, Chairman of the House Judiciary Committee. This is Trey Gowdy, the Chairman of the Immigration Subcommittee. America is a nation of immigrants. Everyone among us can go back a few generations or several generations to find uh, relatives of our own who came to America to search for a better life for themselves and their families. We're also a nation of laws. It is important that any immigration reform bill honor both our history as a nation of immigrants and our respect for the rule of law. Unfortunately, our immigration system today is broken. Past legislative efforts have failed, and today we have 11 million people living in the shadows. This issue is not about abstract statistics and concepts, but rather about real people with real problems trying to provide a better life for their families. While we all agree we need to fix our immigration laws, we have, there are many ideas about how to get to a solution. Regardless of one's position on the larger debate, the way forward is for Congress to pass immigration reform through regular order. In addition, we need to take a closer look at immigration reform in order to avoid making the same mistakes of the past again in the future. By now, we are all aware of the failures of the 1986 immigration overhaul. While politicians assured the American people that it would fix our immigration system, promising tougher enforcement in exchange for the legalization of roughly 3 million people, it has created more problems than it fixed. The American people want to know how Congress plans to avoid this similar outcome in the current debate surrounding immigration reform. The House Judiciary Committee intends to examine immigration reform in a step-by-step approach. We welcome uh, the ideas of uh, all the members of the House. Uh, We have been reaching out to those uh, members with uh, uh, (coughs) briefings and uh, educational Uh, meeting sessions. I think now close to a hundred House Republicans have participated uh, in those briefings where we take them through what legal immigration is, what the law is, uh, what the challenges are with regard to uh, enforcement of our immigration laws, and we take them through a discussion of the different ways to address the needs of uh, uh, the uh, country as a whole and the fact that we have 11 million or more people who are unlawfully present in the country. We are at this point in the process not drawing any conclusions about the best solutions to move forward. Uh, We are very interested in what uh, the Senate Gang of Eight has written uh, and uh, are watching the Senate process closely. And while we have uh, many uh, concerns about aspects of the Senate bills, Uh, At this point, uh, we believe that the appropriate thing to do is for the House to begin this process. And so, uh, starting this week, we will be uh, introducing individual pieces of the overall immigration puzzle. We are also very interested in what the House Gang of Eight produces. Uh, They have been working on this process for a long, long time. And we are very hopeful uh, that they can reach uh, a bipartisan agreement on what uh, will be done uh, to address these three major aspects of immigration reform. Legal immigration reform, enforcement, and uh, what to do about the legal status of the 11 million or more people who are not here lawfully. Once we see uh, what the, the House group produces, We will also be focusing in the committee on that, and we'll be looking at how the individual bills that we're going to start introducing this week, and we will have a number of other individual bills uh, as we move forward in the coming weeks, uh, how those uh, work with uh, what the Gang of Eight produces and see uh, what the will of the House Judiciary Committee is. And uh, we look forward uh, to this process, but we are going to uh, uh, 
uh, take a positive, affirmative action at addressing a uh, broken immigration system in this country. It is in bad need of reform, and the committee uh, intends to examine uh, all of the various aspects of that. This process can be long, but it allows every representative and senator to have their constituents' voices heard. And by taking a fine-tooth comb through each of the individual issues within the larger immigration debate, it will help us get a better bill that will benefit Americans and provide a workable immigration system. Members of the House Judiciary Committee will soon introduce a series of standalone bills that tackle various issues within our immigration system. One that creates a new temporary agriculture guest worker program, another requiring all U.S. employers to use E-Verify uh, will be introduced this week, and we will follow with a number of other issues in coming weeks. Following regular order, the House Judiciary Committee plans to hold legislative hearings on these bills soon so that members can ask questions of the legislation and look for ways to improve them. I want to especially emphasize that that is what we have decided and agreed to do at this point. We have made no decisions about how to proceed forward uh, in terms of a legislative markup, whether it would pertain to individual bills or whether it would pertain to uh, a larger bill. But at this point in time, we think we can help move the process forward by beginning to examine the legislative details of various ideas that members have brought forward. And it's important to note that this is only the beginning of the process, and the, what, we welcome comments from all interested parties. Other bills will be introduced soon, and we will have hearings on the legislative language on those, again, to allow members to carefully vet them. Immigration reform is not an easy task, but a solution is not out of reach. We must make sure we get immigration reform right this time so that we don't have the same problems in the future that we've had with past immigration reform bills, like the one passed in 1986, or immigration reform efforts, like the one that failed in the Senate in 2007 because it was driven from the top down and not brought from the grassroots. The House of Representatives is the people's house. The House of Representatives is uh, where each member of the House listens to their constituents, brings their ideas forward, and then in a good legislative process works together to find uh, common acceptable solutions. And there's absolutely no doubt uh, that the ultimate solution to this process uh, will have to be bipartisan and uh, will have to address a number of different issues. So no one should take uh, the limited bills that we're introducing here this week uh, to be in any way an indication of uh, our overall interest in solving uh, all of the various aspects of uh, uh, immigration reform that are before the House and the Senate. Thank you. And I now want to uh, yield to the Chairman of the Subcommittee, Trey Gowdy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am not going to belabor the points made uh, by Chairman Goodlatte, uh, except to say this. The result and the process, to me at least, are inextricably intertwined. Uh, the best result or product uh, in the world is sometimes mitigated by a process that is less than confidence-inspiring. Uh, that's true in the civil justice system, that's true in the criminal justice system, and it's true in the legislative system. Uh, even ideas that enjoy broad support uh, need to be examined in the public square. Uh, it's more time consuming. It can be argued that it is more fraught with peril, but for those of us uh, that are interested in a remedy that will sustain us uh, for a lifetime, uh, I'm convinced that the extra time spent examining all aspects and subjecting them to cross-examination, if you will, uh, will be well worth it. Uh, so with that, Mr. Chairman, thank you for letting me be a small part of this process, and I would yield back to the gentleman from Virginia. Thank you. We'll be happy to take questions from members of the media. Uh, Chairman Goodlatte, do you anticipate having any legislation that would involve some form of legalization? Uh, we, we are not to that point yet, but uh, obviously uh, if we talk about addressing the three aspects of immigration, uh, you have to get to that point. So we are looking with interest uh, to see what the uh, uh, Senate is doing with that. Uh, we're interested in uh, what uh, House members who are negotiating in a bipartisan fashion do with that. Uh, we have some of our own ideas about that as well. 
uh, but we are in uh, no way uh, able to uh, tell you how that will unfold at this point. Yes, sir. You said that uh, no decisions were made on timing for markup. Is there an expectation that you will mark up and produce a bill or several bills this year? Well, it's our hope that we will, we will be able to accomplish that. Uh, at this point in time, uh, because we're taking a step-by-step -step approach, because we're spending a lot of time uh, holding hearings, listening to members, making sure that uh, we uh, hold hearings on specific legislative uh, language and ideas, and because we are uh, waiting to see what the House Gang of Eight produces, uh, it's not possible to, uh, at this point, give you a, uh, a legislative uh, markup schedule. But we are very, very intent upon getting ourselves to the point where we can do that. Um, on that point of timing, a, one, a member of your committee who's in the, the House group, Raul Labrador, has said that if it doesn't get done this year, it's not going to happen. You, you know, you're emphasizing the, the need to sort of go slow and do it right rather than do it fast. But do you agree with that assessment? I mean, is it this year or, or not at all? Well, let me just say that uh, election years are more difficult than non-election years. But I'll also say uh, that it is far more important uh, that we get this right this time. The American people expect the Congress to get it right than that we live by any particular timetable. So I'm going to be very cautious about uh, setting any kind of uh, arbitrary limits on when this has to get done. Um, yes, yes, ma'am. Is your committee um, committed to marking up that legislation? We have uh, been uh, speaking with uh, members of the Gang of Eight for quite some time now, and I have, uh, in every instance, encouraged them uh, with their work. What they can agree upon in a bipartisan fashion will be very uh, helpful and very informative. But again, no decision has been made regarding how we would proceed <laughs> Uh, with that legislation or with the individual pieces of legislation which members of the committee will be introducing over the next uh, few weeks. Yes, sir. How many pieces of legislation do you expect? Can you give us a number? There will be several. But, but uh, we 10, don't, 15? We don't know yet, but several. You mentioned inclusion of ag guest, an ag guest worker program. Uh, Senator Grassley this week brought up the point that at 10 years after the 86 law, only a small percentage of those coming into the country legally under the Ag uh, Worker Program stayed in agriculture. Many of them went to other more lucrative jobs. Do you expect to uh, offer any specific uh, controls to limit that problem? And also, um, separately, um, the U.S. territories, there are ideas to cover them in the Senate, particularly the Northern Marianas. Do you see inclusion? of a more permanent status for long-term guest workers? Well, first let me say that the legislation we're introducing uh, is for the purpose of uh, getting input, getting ideas, getting responses uh, to it. We do not view anything that we're introducing as a uh, final product. It is a work in progress, and each one of these will be considered and viewed that way. We'll be informed, for example, by what uh, the bipartisan negotiators uh, do in the House. We will be looking with interest to see what is done in the Senate. Uh, but I will also say that uh, the agricultural worker programs that followed the 1986 Act uh, did not work. And so our first goal is to make sure that we have a, a worker program that works for agriculture, because if we are to address all aspects of immigration reform, the issue of people uh, staying in agriculture will be an important one. And I would expect that if we had a legalization program, and this is just speculation, but if we had one, uh, that uh, it's not going to restrict people to where they work. If you're lawfully president in the United States, you're going to be able to work in a lot of different places. So some of the people who work in agriculture today who may not be here lawfully may not continue to work in agriculture. So one of the key components of uh, an immigration reform bill will be to have a good agriculture worker program. We think that is uh, fundamental to the overall process. And legal I mean, in the here. We'll, we'll look at that, but that's uh, something that we'll, we'll have uh, further discussions about. In, in your so, opinion, do you think that a piecemeal, um, a couple different bills, uh, is a more viable way to pass immigration reform than a comprehensive bill? That I think the value of introducing individual bills is, allows us to carefully examine 
not only each aspect of immigration reform, but how those pieces will interact with other pieces, uh, and then uh, how they can fit together in something larger if we are able to uh, find something uh, that could uh, uh, have the kind of support in the House that would be necessary to pass it. So we're, we're not passing any judgment on, on uh, how that will all work out in the end, but we do believe that the process needs to move forward, and as the process moves forward, uh, we'll be looking at uh, uh, lots of issues. I would, I would imagine that people who are working on this elsewhere, both in the Senate and the Gang of Eight, will be uh, interested in seeing uh, what uh, is introduced by members of the House Judiciary Committee, just as we're interested in seeing uh, what they produce uh, in the Senate and in this bipartisan discussion going on in the House. What would you prefer, though, in, in terms I'm of... Not, I'm not stating any preference at this point. I am simply stating that this is a way uh, for the committee to, to uh, move forward on fixing our broken immigration system. Congressman, as, as Chairman of House Judiciary, can we get your thoughts on the Boston bombing the suspect? Did the judge step in too early? And perhaps Mr. Gowdy, as a former prosecutor, could share his thoughts, too. Uh, I, I, this uh, is really about the uh, immigration reform process, and uh, if you'd like to speak with our communication director, we'd be happy to talk to you about that uh, at a different time, but we don't want this to become too far-ranging. The jurisdiction of the Judiciary Committee is very vast, and there are lots of issues we're working with right now, but I think we should limit this to immigration. Yes, ma'am. Um, related to that, sir, there's been a lot of discussion on whether those attacks are relevant to the current immigration debate, in your opinion. Do you, do you agree with that? I think there are some things that we can, uh, we can take from uh, that that are related to immigration. For example, uh, the question arises, what kind of information was used in the vetting of the naturalization applicants, applications of uh, both of the brothers? As you know, one succeeded in getting naturalization, the other was held up. Uh, and uh, I think it would be very worthwhile knowing more about that process and uh, what the considerations were uh, by uh, uh, the Immigration Service, uh, USCIS, in terms of uh, making the decisions about that. And I also think that uh, it is uh, instructive to note that immigration uh, reform should in include consideration of how not just the FBI, and this is a, that was a criminal case involving a bombing and not an immigration case, but uh, how law enforcement at all levels working together can help to make a legal structure work better than just relying entirely upon uh, the federal government to uh, carry out and enforce our immigration laws. That's not included in uh, any of the bills that we're introducing this week, but is certainly something that's a matter of discussion. Uh, and what uh, take, took place in Boston, where I think it was widely viewed as very successful cooperation between uh, local, state, and federal law enforcement that led to uh, the, uh, the speedy apprehension uh, and uh, getting under control of the situation in Boston. Yes, sir, in the uh, back. In, in following up on that question, do you think the, uh, the, the process of granting asylum, the asylum process, should be reformed in light of the Boston bond? Well, we certainly will. Uh, view that as a part of overall comprehensive immigration reform. We've made no uh, decisions yet, and none of the bills that we have at this point deal with asylum, but that is certainly possible uh, that it should be addressed, and we'll be looking to see, again, uh, what ideas the bipartisan groups uh, have, and we'll be discussing this uh, amongst ourselves in the committee and listening to other ideas, because uh, obviously uh, when, you, when you talk about the issue of political asylum, people who are being persecuted elsewhere in the world, uh, asylum is designed to give them a uh, safe haven in the United States, a good purpose, but uh, if there are peop people getting asylum because they are in uh, the minority but uh, engaging in aggressive tactics in their home country uh, that may cause them to be uh, uh, susceptible to doing the same thing elsewhere, that obviously ought to be a part of our consideration in granting political asylum to avoid situations like Boston. Yes? Bills from any of your Democratic colleagues on the committee, or is this from our Republican effort? Uh, th thus far, uh, these are uh, uh, pieces of legislation that uh, will have uh, bipartisan support, and uh, they will uh, uh, not always necessarily be. We, we're we're going to have co sponsors of the legislation, uh, but the primary sponsor, the introducer of the bill, will be uh, members of the committee, and so far, uh, they are uh, House Republican committee members, but we expect that there'll be bipartisan support for these Did efforts. You ask for any bills? We, uh, we welcome bills 
from anyone who wants to introduce them. And some Democrats have introduced bills already that have been uh, uh, sent to the committee. And so we certainly would welcome uh, uh, their legislation. And depending upon what it does and how it fits with what the House Gang of Eight is doing and uh, how it fits with what uh, we are doing uh, on the committee, uh, we will certainly uh, be willing to look at those as well. Yes, sir. Do you personally favor a path to citizenship? Uh, I have stated previously that there's a wide range of uh, uh, solutions to what to do with uh, 11 million people who are not lawfully here, uh, and that uh, I prefer not to see a special pathway to citizenship, but a status uh, that uh, were to give them uh, some kind of legal status uh, is certainly uh, something that we should consider, but it's going to very much depend upon the enforcement uh, mechanisms uh, that can be included in legislation and what is done about legal immigration reform because all of these things uh, very much interrelate to each other. So what exactly can be done there remains to be seen. Uh, yes, sir. Say, how do you respond to critics who say by trying to slow walk it or who accuse you of trying to slow walk it by taking your time <coughs> hearing or taking all these individual uh, piecemeal bills instead of uh, looking at the momentum going through the Senate right now? Well, we're certainly not doing that. We have been working very hard on this, uh, and we respect uh, the effort of others, but we encourage all of them to be careful, examine the legislation very closely, understand how each component of immigration relates to every other piece, so that we don't get uh, the law of unintended consequences taking hold in this matter. And I would point out that the House group the bipartisan group that's been negotiating this has been negotiating it for about four years. So we want to see a product from that group, but we recognize, and I'm sure they recognize, how difficult it is uh, to work on this issue, and therefore making sure that we take our time is an important part of this process. As I said before, it is not whether you do it fast or slow, it is that you get it right that's most important. And uh, uh, I think that's going to be the hallmark of the work that we do uh, on this legislation. Mr. Chairman, David? can you talk a little bit more about the education sessions that you've done, sort of how those have gone? I just know you said you've done them with about 100 members. You see those continuing forward. And for Chairman Dowdy, could you just talk about being from South Carolina, it's a state that's got a lot of attention in regard to immigration reform? Obviously, with your. Tap me on the shoulder if you want to ask into those other questions. <laughs> yeah, but you go ahead. Well, with respect to the listening sessions, Chairman Goodlatte and, and Kevin McCarthy have done a fantastic job, along with uh, members of the staff from, from House Judiciary. They've been very interactive, uh, very well attended, uh, every bit as well attended as, as Paul's listening sessions with respect to the, to, to the budget and, and the debt deal of 2011. So I think that's been wonderful. You know, South Carolina, obviously Senator Graham has been on the, on the tip of the spear, so to speak, uh, on the Senate side. And uh, Mick Mulvaney has uh, has recently uh, become more engaged on immigration. Um, I represent uh, a district uh, with less than two percent uh, Latino voters, so uh, this is not a political exercise to me, which is why I appreciate so much the approach the chairman has taken. I, I would like a remedy that sustains us for the remainder of my lifetime. So uh, I am much more interested in the process being one that is confidence inspiring than a political remedy, and that's what my constituents want. I did go to Jeff Denham's district a couple of weeks ago, which is very different from South Carolina, and, I, and I'm looking to travel more. If my colleagues uh, want someone who talks slow to come to their districts and have town halls with them, I'm happy to do that, too. It's good for me to see that the rest of the country does not uh, necessarily mirror the 4th Congressional District in South Carolina, um, but surprisingly, the, the thread that weaves through all of these districts is a desire to make sure this is the last time we have this conversation as a country. And I, let me add to that with regard to uh, your question. Uh, this process, education process, is a very, very important part of getting this done right because we have to have buy-in from members of Congress to understand the nature of the problem in the first place and then the various ideas to solve it. And uh, most members of Congress do not have uh, a tremendous background in immigration law. We're fortunate on the committee to have three members uh, uh, who have practiced immigration law prior to coming to Congress, myself, Zoe Lofgren, and Raul Labrador, uh, but that's not true 
of the overwhelming majority of members of the House on both sides of the aisle. And as a result of that, uh, these educational sessions, I think, are very important. Uh, as, as we noted, uh, we're, we're up uh, or, uh, around or close to 100 who participated, but that still leaves uh, uh, about 130 who haven't. So uh, it takes time uh, to get members to put this on their schedule, uh, to know how important it is. And uh, I think uh, our function in moving uh, legislation into the committee so that we can look at it uh, and uh, hold legislative hearings on it, which we are now beginning that process of, will be a wake-up call to those who haven't come uh, to say, hey, you better come down and uh, start looking seriously about uh, what we're doing on immigration because we do uh, have a broken immigration system and the House does intend to play uh, its leading role in making sure that this is addressed. Uh, someone who has an asked question for you. Yes, yeah, sir. you have a lot of members of your caucus, conservatives, who say that anything that doesn't start with border security is going nowhere. Um, what do you say then? Why, uh, why not take that up first? Well, first of all, uh, I think that uh, when you look at for example, the Senate bill, one of the things that we have to consider in the House is, uh, are we going to be able to assure those members and a great number of the American people uh, that the uh, border security component, which, by the way, is being worked on by uh, uh, Chairman McCall and the Homeland Security Committee, because we have an interest in that, but that's primarily their jurisdiction, uh, and the interior enforcement uh, issues, uh, E-Verify is a component of that, but there are other interior uh, enforcement issues which we think will be addressed uh, uh, in uh, legislation that will be introduced into the committee uh, in the not too distant future are very, very important. And I think that uh, uh, any discussion about what happens with the legal status of people has to look at are those things going to happen? Let me just give you one example. For 18 years now, we've been waiting for the Immigration Service to produce uh, an entry exit system so that people will know when people enter the country legally, and by the way, 35 to 40 percent of the people who are not lawfully present in the country today entered legally under business visas, visitors visas, student visas, visa waivers, and simply overstayed the time they were allowed to be present in the country. Uh, that type of uh, enforcement mechanism and uh, the promise of it has got to be more than just a promise in this legislation. So uh, looking at it from the standpoint of how can we assure folks that these things will be in place uh, before we start uh, giving uh, legal status to people uh, is a part of this discussion. But it does not have to be all in one separate bill and then come back and revisit the other later. It can all be looked at uh, in uh, one piece of legislation or in several pieces of legislation, as uh, uh, we've pointed out uh, ad infinitum this morning. We'll take a few more questions. Yes, Just sir. Two quick follow-ups for both of you. Um, on your listening or educational sessions, are you bringing in any outsiders? Uh, and, and if so, who might they be to educate you? And then, uh, Congressman Gowdy, you say you would like to go across the country. Do you have anything currently scheduled, or are there areas specifically that you'd like to visit um, to sort of help better understand this situation. I'll let, I'll let Trey take that one first since I'm hogging the microphone. Well, the last time I went to a party I wasn't invited to, I did not have a good time. So I am waiting until my, my colleagues uh, invite me, but I have made it clear. In fact, I've invited Raul, who I have tremendous respect for, and he is a personal friend. I've invited him to come to South Carolina. I want my constituents to hear his perspective. Um, I will go uh, anywhere I'm invited, uh, keeping in mind my first preference is to be in South Carolina with my family. But if it can be worked out, if I'll go to across the country, the Denham's district, I'll go certainly to places closer. Uh, happy to go to Texas, happy to go with Luis if he wants me to go to, to, to Illinois. Um, I, I'll go wherever I'm invited, but I don't want to inject myself in someone's district absent uh, an invitation. Uh, and ditto to that, and also with regard to your first question, uh, we at this point have not had uh, outside guests uh, come to attend uh, uh, those sessions, but we uh, have not precluded the possibility of doing that uh, moving forward. Right now we're, we have uh, uh, a rather uh, intense uh, education in a very complex subject uh, that takes uh, quite a bit of time and then allows uh, an even greater amount of time for members to interject, ask questions, make comments. That's really what we're trying to stimulate there. 
Uh, let me get some folks who haven't asked questions. I'm curious what your opinion is on the DREAM Act and if you would support something similar to that. Well, uh, as we look at the overall issue of immigration reform and if we look at the status of people who are not lawfully present in the country, uh, it should be obvious to most that people who were brought here by their parents uh, are in a different status, and I think probably in a different status in the eyes of a great many American people than people who willfully uh, uh, violated the immigration laws either in crossing the border or entering the country uh, legally and then overstaying uh, their visa. Uh, but it, it raises a good point that you don't have to consider the 11 million as one uh, body of people. Obviously, people who have uh, uh, committed crimes are not going to be covered by uh, any legalization program. And so you have a number of, of different categories of people that could be looked at uh, for different treatment, but no decisions have been made about uh, how to do that at this point. Uh, we'll take these two and then we'll call it quits. Yes, sir. If there is ultimately uh, some legal status program for those who are already here, how important to you is the issue of payment of back taxes by these people? Well, it's going to, first of all, uh, it's the, the cost of uh, doing immigration reform is going to obviously be something that uh, uh, not just the committee but the entire Congress will have to look at closely. And uh, one of the things that uh, uh, you can look at is what uh, would be required of people uh, who gain a legal status uh, in order to help uh, address the fact that there are uh, lots of government programs, lots of costs to it, but also uh, perhaps uh, there can be some uh, help in, in meeting those costs. Again, no decisions have been made about that at this point. Yes, sir. I uh, just wonder if you could comment on the proposal in the Senate bill to uh, have the new W visa program and the new um, agency that would determine numbers of low-skill labor coming in. Uh, we are looking at that. Uh, again, uh, we, uh, as you'll see, because we're going to be introducing uh, an agricultural guest worker uh, bill this week, uh, you will see that uh, there is uh, an interest in addressing uh, the issues that arise when uh, you have certain sectors of our economy that have uh, shortfalls of workers. And we want to make sure that that works both for U.S. citizens who want to work in those areas and for the employers who have shortages of workers so they can meet them. Uh, but beyond the agricultural work, uh, no additional decisions have been made. We will be looking closely at what the Senate bill includes. And with that, uh, we're going to thank you all. Uh, this is Catherine Rexrod, the Communications Director of the Committee. Some of you may know her, and uh, those of you who didn't get to ask a question or have a follow-up question, uh, see Catherine, and we'll try to accommodate your interests. Thank you all for coming out today.
here in the Senate this evening, a, a procedural vote to end debate on the internet, internet sales tax bill. It passed uh, with a vote of 63 to 30. So there will be a vote on final passage of that bill on Monday, May 6th at 5 p.m. Eastern after a week-long break. Here's a Senator Heidi Heitkamp who supports the bill, also Senator Max Baucus who had been blocking amendments from coming to the floor. I'll be very brief. Uh, I just want to respond to a couple claims that have been made, especially related to foreign corporations, because I think there's this sense that foreign corporations have absolutely no state tax obligations, no matter what they do in your state, no matter what their presence is. So I just want to clarify a couple points. Um, you know, as people argue that foreign taxes uh, that rem make remote sales will have an advantage over domestic companies, um, we need to understand that that's not true. The Marketplace Fairness Act treats foreign corporations the same as it treats domestic corporations. By that I mean corporations that are incorporated in the in the 50 states in our, in our country. All online retailers that make over a million in remote sales, regardless of where the retailer is located, must collect and remit sales tax to states that require it. Um, states currently have and do exert jurisdiction over foreign companies. In fact, states collect different types of tax from foreign companies, even when those companies are exempt from federal taxation. Locating facilities, and there's been a big argument here that it means that people will now move their operations to Canada and operate out of a foreign country. That has its own brand of problems for any corporation that would consider that. I want to just outline some of those. Um, locating facilities outside of the 46 states while still selling to the United States consumers would actually increase some costs for retailers and complicate the sales process. Locating further away from customers would increase shipping costs. Many online retailers are locating uh, distribution and other facilities closer to their consumers so they can be more responsive. In fact, we're seeing one-day shipping or same-day shipping today. International sales may be subject to duties. Foreign currency exchanges may be needed to conduct the sale. And so it's a whole brave new world. It's a very complicated world. And the other thing is there's a big discussion about how do you enforce it. Well, states can currently request information from Customs and Border Protection about international shipments into their states so they know what products are coming in and where they come from. I just want to take a moment to kind of explain, as you've heard um, in this discussion on the floor, that I, in fact, was the tax uh, commissioner of the state of North Dakota that initiated the, the action in Quill. And, and, um, but that's not the extent of my experience. I also spent a great deal, in fact, six years of my life as tax commissioner collecting sales and use taxes. Um, we frequently have people who move across the border into Canada, go up shopping, spend a weekend in Canada, come through. Their custom reports are filed. We typically would send a sales tax auditor up to review those custom reports and send use tax um, collection statements out as a result of that. And so that kind of compliance is already happening. Um, states also have enforcement options available to them to ensure foreign corporation um, compliance is, in, is, is uh, completed, including liens and other kinds of discussions. I uh, want to just um, offer up a CRS report. That said, finally, and it's on this issue, finally, some have noted that U.S.-based retailers may respond to expanded sales tax collection authority by shifting operations outside the United States to avoid collection burden. The cost of moving operations and increased shipping costs, however, would seem greater than any benefit conferred by avoiding the collection burden. Again, as you have heard over and over again, we've, been, we've heard over and over about how expensive this is, yet we have vendors out there, in fact, eBay, that is charging no more than $15 a month to provide this service to um, businesses that they have. And at least you hear, while well, that's all nice, fine and good, Senator Heitkamp, um, you know, I don't believe you that it actually happens. I, I requested some information from our current tax commissioner and current tax department in North Dakota because I know a little bit about sales and use tax and I know that we actually have uh, 